Welcome to the Growth League podcast, where we interview business owners who have experienced quantum leap growth in their business. In each episode, we're going to dive deep into our guest's firsthand experience about what it was like 90 days before and 90 days after that point when their business started experiencing massive growth. Welcome. We are here with my good friend and coach and mentor and all around great guy, Mr. Matthew Hunt. Matt, how's it going, man? Good, man. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> awesome. Matt has, uh, you guys can probably see there, he has one of the better, uh, one of the better sound booth options uh, around. He, uh, he doesn't, doesn't cheap out when it comes to perfect audio. So thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. Matt, let me, let me uh, read your bio here for, for everyone so that uh, they can get to know you a little bit more. So Matt has, uh, has built three B2B companies in the last 13 years, all of them profitable, by the way, which that is the objective of, of business. And all of them built on the back of smart marketing and sales techniques and strategies. Um, he's worked with hundreds of companies, large and small. Uh, some examples include uh, Remax, Valvoline, FedEx, and Chef's Plate. Um, his expertise is SEM, SEO, CRO, PPC, funnel optimization, LinkedIn marketing, email automation, and sales. Uh, but the list goes on. Um, he's a he's a macro thinker, which is fantastic, especially as you're heading into a global pandemic. Um, and uh, and and he's been a, a a voice of reason and strategy for me over the last couple of years. Um, currently. Matt is launching his fourth company, um, and it will be the focus, from what I understand, Matt, uh, in, in 2021, and it is called Army of Trust, and it's where he helps B2B entrepreneurs scale their business by investing in invisible funnels. You have to tell us more about that. Invisible funnels that leverage community and drive more trust through one-to-many selling strategies. This is my guest, Mr. Matthew Hunt. Ah. <laughs> How's it going, man? Good, man. Thanks. I, I'm excited to be here. I mean, it's always so much fun chatting with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, as well. Back at you. So let's get into it. Um, I'm going to start with a broad one. What, what is, and, and you know what, um, as you go through these examples, um, you know, you can toggle back and forth between different businesses uh, that, you've, you, that you've run and grown and, and, and either exited or done whatever with. Um, <laughs> because I know you have a lot of experience. So for um, maybe for one of your, your, your past agency or automation, Wolf, what is the origin story uh, for, for your first business? Let's go there. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I kind of just stumbled all into it <laughs> by accident out of need. So the first business that I grew, it, it turned into a lead generation business, but it wasn't I didn't intend for that to take place. It was actually because I was doing door-to-door -door sales for a merchant account company. And door-to-door um, <clears throat> -door sales kind of sucks. It's hard. <laughs> Tell me about it, man. How, so, do you, what do you got? Skin of, skin of steel now? Thick skin? Or how does... Well, you definitely get, well, so I got into it because I was, I was actually a theater actor, but there was like times in between gigs. So sometimes I'll be working for doing a show for six weeks and other times it'd be for four months, but there'd be big gaps in there. And so I did the traditional bartender server thing that that's so cliche that, that actors do. And I was getting tired of that. And so I had a buddy of mine, uh, his name's Dat too. He's a very good friend of mine. And he, actually first introduced me to multi-level networking, which was like Amway's quick start, which was like a total yeah. failure, but, but, but it, it changed my thinking of starting to understand a little bit about the opportunities of becoming an entrepreneur or a business owner. So that was great for that. I never did anything with it. I, I failed epically just like most people do in that line of business, but I started reading books like, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And I, my brain started going, oh, this is really interesting. Like I didn't even know that this stuff existed. And because of that, you know, the logical progression is to go from employee to self-employed, from self-employed to business owner, from business owner to investor. And I literally took that journey. So I, I went into being self-employed where I got a straight commissions job selling 
the credit card processing machines and ATM machines. And um, it was a good job. Like, you know, you'd make, you'd make like 400 bucks to 1500 bucks as a straight commission. If you sold one, plus you get a little bit of the transaction fee for every business you sold it to. So there was a bit of that residual income, which I, I knew a little bit about because of royalties on acting and voiceovers and commercials through, through the Actra union. And uh, when it came to film and television and, and radio, um, obviously there's no royalties for the theater. <laughs> you just get a, it's more like a job, but I, I, I saw that as being appealing. And so I thought, well, I'm already auditioning and used to walking in the places and most of the time people telling me no. Um, so I thought, well, what's the big deal about, you know, knocking some doors and being told no, you know, 90 times out of a day and yep. nine maybes and maybe one sale. So I was literally, I, I went, I joined this company and it was like, um, it was like the boiler room. It was literally like they'd ramp, they'd, they'd ramp you up early in the morning yep. and then they'd send you out knocking on the doors during the day. And they would tell you, just run your numbers, knock a hundred doors, you'll make a sale a day. And at that time, that money seemed really, really good. And, and it was, and it seemed like it worked really well with my artistic um, endeavors at the time that I could kind of make my own hours and I didn't have to work full time and yeah. still make full time money. But after about a year or so, it started getting a little bit like bored. Well, not bored, but it just wasn't fun. Right. <laughs> it wasn't fun. And, and this is when I started realizing that I was actually an entrepreneur. And I didn't realize it so much later in my career, but I've always in my life gravitated towards trying to fix things. And that's all an entrepreneur does is they're, mm. they're, pro they're, they are, they're problem solvers. And so I was doing this even as an employee. I used to drive my bosses crazy. And there's been times I've been fired because I used to challenge the status quo of like, why are we doing it this way it's stupid there's a better way of doing it and i didn't have any filter at the time being a young young man and i would tell them this is stupid <laughs> yeah and of course they would get angry with me they love that they yeah love they, that. bosses love that they, they, yeah. they love being told that their system is dumb <laughs> yeah <laughs> and That's so nice. you know it ended up a lot of churn with lots of different jobs but i start to realize oh like you know this, there's, there's a place for this. And so what ended up happening was it was a very slow process for me, very painfully slow is I first started saying, okay, well, if I have to knock a hundred doors, wouldn't it be easier if I just open the yellow pages and start calling people? And so what I did was I literally opened the yellow pages and I'd pick a vertical like beauty salons and I would just literally cold call them from the my house rental in the basement there <laughs> and and i would just cold call people and set up all my appointments on one day because like i don't want to go and knock doors every single day let me just spend two days cold calling and then i'll go out once a week and close those deals and so i did that and it worked pretty good but even that started to feel gross <laughs> and not fun so then i switched it over to something called fax broadcasting this is where you can see the if you're if you're Facts. watching it, you can see the gray hairs on my chin of how old I am. That <laughs> you're like thirty, what's, man. Come on. What's a what's a fax machine, right? So this is right. where you would really spam fax machines. So I pay some guy four hundred bucks, and he would put a flyer in a fax machine that would fax all these fax machines with other another hundred flyers, and I'd piss off you know a thousand business owners. But what would happen was. I would, uh, I'd make a sale or two. I was like, Hey, that's pretty good. Like uh, I spent 400 bucks. I made two grand. Let's, let's do that more until I finally realized, Oh, that's kind of not, <laughs> that's not a nice thing to do. I was like, it's not ethically really probably the best way to go about doing it, which then translated into me doing automated voice drops. So this is before you had like slide broadcast today, but I actually then found a company that could call businesses phone numbers and um, leave a message there. But the technology back then wasn't so good that I actually bought three desktop PCs and I bought a software program that scraped the yellow pages. Come on. And, and then it would automatically call these businesses. But what's so funny is that it didn't have the technology to know if it was someone live or a voicemail at the time. So, so for context, so, where, what, what year, where are we and what year is this? Oh, geez. Are we this in Toronto? Would, this, this would be 2006-ish, 2005. Okay. 
and and so I, my solution to it, this is how, you know, I'm, I wasn't, I'm not very bright. I'm a very slow learner was like, I'll just make the thing call at night when businesses aren't there, because I didn't want it to trigger the automated recorded message right. <laughs> to these businesses during the day. I just wanted to hit the voicemail and the message is basically was like this, Hey, if you're accepting credit cards and it's from these particular places, I can almost guarantee you, I can save you a full percent on your fees. Right. So you know, a business was, for example, doing a million dollars a year and they're paying 3%, that's $30,000 in expenses. I say, I get it to you for 2%, save them 10 grand. So people would be interested in that. That's all I wanted to communicate was I could, I could right. save you money, right? And so then I would, then what ended up happening was I started becoming a little bit of an order taker. And I was like, oh, this is cool. But the problem was I was calling, I was spamming basically people's voice machines <laughs> and, and pissing people off too. So I was like, okay, this doesn't feel very ethical either. So I was like, I'm on Google all the time. I bet you people are starting to search this stuff. And so in 2007, I built my first website and I got a buddy of mine who knew how to build a website. And at the time I wrote what's called a sales letter, a single page, what you would call a funnel today, a single page, squeeze page. There was a sales funnel. And I bought the book call, that called uh, The Definitive Guide to Google AdWords by Perry Marshall. And I taught myself how to do Google AdWords. And that kind of launched my career from there. At that point, it was like I was I was getting, you know, clicks for as little as 25 cents on keywords like merchant accounts or credit card processing because I was an early adopter. The banks hadn't been doing it yet. And I and I just started crushing it. And I was still working as an independent sales rep for this company, but they didn't know how I was making my sales because they didn't really care. It was straight commission, but I became like top salesperson. And I ended up doing so well that I hired uh, that friend of mine to be the order taker for it. And I took all the profits from that company and I just started like spending money on every digital course that I could buy to learn everything I could about internet marketing. And so I learned how to build websites on WordPress. I learned how to do SEO and local SEO. And, and over the course of three years, I finally worked up to the courage to start my first agency in 2010. And so that's sort of the origin story of how I got where I am now. And, you know, I spent the last, you know, 10 plus years building agencies and doing a lot of B2B marketing and learning how to really build a real business, you know, yeah. like a, a, a legit business. <laughs> Remind me again, what was the name of your first agency? This one that it was the worst, from worst business name in the world it was actually called small business online coach. Like, could you... <laughs> and so the initial goal was for me was I actually didn't want to be an agency. I just wanted to get people to subscribe to an online coaching program, but I was, I was too ahead of the time. People didn't want to do that. Then people will do it now. It's a great model today, like online group coaching, fantastic model to be yeah. involved in. And every agency actually ends up creating this program at some point in their career now. But back then, nobody wanted to know that. And when I was dealing specifically with small businesses, they didn't want to learn how to do it. They're too busy doing all the other parts of the business. They just wanted someone to do it for them. Right. So I quickly realized within 60 days, no one wanted to buy that product. And they just said, hey, Matt, this is awesome. You're smart. Can you just do it for me? So then right. I switched to the model of done for you, right? Gotcha. Yeah. So this is the growth league and, and this is a, a new community that we've built and the topic that we're, we're hovering around and diving into and, and, and circling around with our, with our guests is uh, the moment of growth. Right. And, and, and it never really distills down to one single moment, but is mm -hmm. there something that stands out to you where uh, you know, over maybe a course of a couple of weeks or a couple of days or a couple of months, can you describe a, a memorable tipping point from when it went to sort of a hobby business to, okay, well, this is now on the scale train. Talk about that moment when, when you started experiencing that massive uptick. Well, I've, I've, so I've been very lucky. So because I've been an early adopter on so many of these, these trends, I was actually never very good at what I did but got to capitalize on being early that I've always had growth just naturally without trying very hard. So my heart goes out to actually people who are starting an agency today. You actually need to be good at what you do. <laughs> that's, 
That's hilarious. <laughs> so, so even back then it was easy too. like SEO was easy. Like when I started with SEO, it was just a lot of keyword stuffing, or you would use blog networks and backlinks to just spam your way to the top of the search engines. Right. And everybody knew how it worked, but obviously they've, they've solved all those problems today where it's much harder. You actually need to be a very good marketer today to do well with search engine optimization or even pay-per-click, like cost per click are a lot more. I still think attention is cheap to buy. Like I, I still yeah. think there's tons of room and tons of growth, but it you actually have to have some skills today. So back then I, I didn't really need to have good ones. Um, and I had the luxury of being able to fail while it was safe because there was no rules or regulations on how you do things. And there was no white hat, black hat, gray hat, or, any kind of like ethics around what is the right way of etiquette or etiquette on how to do these things. And so I made a lot of mistakes, but while still being invisible, which was a great hmm. place to be. Like if I had made some of those mistakes today, I probably would have got tapped. Like I could have gotten tapped by like can spam laws and regulations or castle or, or, you know, all kinds of stuff just wouldn't have worked the same way. So I was very, very lucky to be able to experiment and, and, and learn in those environments where it was safe and lots of breathing room to make those errors. <laughs> so you, when you talk about your, your uh, success was tethered largely to being first or, or kind of paving a path, pioneering a little bit of uh, mm -hmm. uh, real estate there, what role does, does having macro mindset and, and macroeconomics on the top of your mind and macro movement of people and, and technology, why, how does that play into it? Because I know you're a big proponent of this. And um, was that critical in, in being first or, or were you just oh, I had no too, clue. too dumb to I, know any better? I, I was too, too dumb to know any better. Sometimes naivety goes a long way. If you knew everything, you if you knew how hard it was going to be or what you had to do, you probably wouldn't even start it. So that naivety sometimes is is a blessing in in disguise when when you're starting something. And sometimes why it's easier for a 20 year old something to do something than it is for a 40 year old or a 50 year old. You know, especially when you have nothing to lose. Like I right. had no money, no nest egg, not, nothing. So it didn't matter, and I was too dumb. But now that I'm older and wiser and been through a few businesses and learned a few things. I do believe understanding macro trends as a whole is very important in making the right decisions. And if you can understand that, then you can usually make some of the right micro decisions that you need to make locally or within your niche in your business that will ride that train, you know? So for, for example, you know, right now, you know, we're going to be on a macro growth with probably crypto and blockchain technology, right? I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> Hey, everyone get out your notepads because <laughs> hold on time out here because, uh, you know, you, you've shared a number of different, uh, tips or, or tricks with me over the, over the last couple of years and sure as hell they can, you know, I, I see it happening then like four weeks later or five weeks later. So get out your notepads, carry <laughs> okay. on. Yeah, so so we can see that we're going to be on a ride of this journey, you know, over the next five to 10 years where we will move towards more of a, a, a digital currency, as well as like blockchain will be the will be the supporting part of, of everything finance wise and you can see little little bits of it being uh, dripped out there but if you can spot that then you can you can get a foothold in certain certain areas mm -hmm. same thing with anything digital too like when it comes to e-commerce you know we're still just scratching the the tip of the surface of the opportunities that are there or even when it comes to being a media company and personal branding you're still an early adopter today where in 10 years you can easily be the next oprah the next you know gary v the next uh, David, uh, uh, David, uh, Patrick, but, but David, right. Or Tom from impact theory. Uh, these are all at your fingertips and it's all democratized. And if you can spot that and see that, and you can start being consistent today, regularly going forward, you can provide one huge impact <laughs> for, yeah. for people and two, you know, have an incredible asset that's going to last you generations. <laughs> right of wealth, you know, well, and wealth is just a tool. I mean, all that money totally. stuff's just a tool anyways. That's not That's important. Right. That's right. Um, when you're entering something brand new or you're, you're, you're 
you know, being first and pioneering a new space. Um, certainly there needs to be a couple th things that show up for you to give you that, okay, yeah, this is a good direction to go into. Like, what are you looking for when, when you're trying to be first at something to justify the, the, that first step? Yeah. So, so I, th I, th I think the answer to this is you want to really surround yourself with the right people and the right relationships and, and people who are smarter than you. You know, I, everyone's heard the expression before, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? You, <laughs> and so the, the trick is first finding all those people to go to, and you don't need to know them personally. So there's enough podcasts today and YouTube channels and books and things like this at your fingertips that you can get around these people and they can be your mentors or your thought leaders to help, help you go there. So the first thing is finding out who are the smartest people and then you want to actually consume everything that they are talking about. And not only that, you want to make sure you're finding people who are having success ahead of you, but have also done it many different ways. And because there's more than one way to skin a cat, but what's important is that you actually get different opinions as long as it's coming from success. What you don't want to get is just an, get an opinion, like anything. Right. you know, just opinions. It's, they're just like assholes. Everybody's got one. Right. Yeah. So, so, so posting a question or getting involved in an open forum is not the best approach. You want to make sure that all the individuals have had success. And this is something that Ray Dalio talks about all the time. If you haven't read his book principles, he has a fantastic system for figuring out what's going to be great or not great and where it's going to go. And so it's always, it's always who first, right. <laughs> And then the how comes after. And sometimes you don't even need to know the how. The real trick as you get really good at growing businesses is not as you actually forget the how altogether. You don't even care about it anymore. You're only hyper-focused on finding who. Who, right. who, who, do you, what, who do you need and, and what's the right bum you, you need to put in the right seat? And then your only job is helping paint the, the vision and removing friction. Like hmm. that's, that's it. That's, that's your only job. But when you're starting out, it's not always like that. And you're trying to figure out your place or the ego comes in and you think that you need to actually be the expert. But that's the biggest mistake you can be is actually try to, trying to be the expert. The most important thing to do is stop trying to be the expert. Instead, become a talent scout. Interesting. So it sounds like with, the first, your, with your first business, with your first agency, you just kind of stumbled in it, into it because if you were brave enough to be first, you were going to succeed. So as time goes on and, and you know, uh, you build more businesses and, and um, can you think back to, for, for any of the businesses, can you think back to something specific that you put in place, fully expecting scale to happen and scale was the result? So cause and effect. Sure. So, so th honestly, the, the easiest way to scale a business is, is by doing good work. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa. Go, whoa whoa like whoa oh, hold on hold, hold on. on what do 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 what you say you're gonna do and over deliver right. Right? right and then magically something happens is people talk about you and they send you more business right is that a referral <laughs> that's that's called a referral yeah what, <laughs> what do we know about referrals though the volatility right well, they're unpredictable. Sometimes uh, there are there are tactics and strategies that you can deploy to make them more more predictable. But there are definitely challenges with referrals if you don't have a couple tactics and processes in place to make sure you're getting the right ones. Um, uh, getting any referral can can be noise, <laughs> and and also saying yes to all your referrals can also be noise as your company grows if you're more in a b2b type service-based business because it's not always the right thing to do and often people close those deals or do those deals and it's because they lack other systems to have predictable leads in their in their in their business 
And so when you don't have predictable leads, then you make decisions to close people you shouldn't close. And when you close people you shouldn't close, it's not good for your business. It's not good for your team. It's also not good for those particular clients. So the mistake that people make all the time is they, as they're growing, they get excited about attracting and closing and scaling, but they have to remember one of the most important parts of the business is also setting up systems in place that you can repel and say no just mm-hmm. as much as you're you're growing so you, you need the yin with the yang you, 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 yeah. you do you have an you example of, do you have an example of that where let's say in your heart in your mind you really want to close this deal maybe you've been dry for a little while um, but what systems have you relied on to stick close and adhere close to your depiction of an ideal client someone that's going to help propel your business forward what systems have you relied on to say no when your heart's telling you to go? Well, so, uh, so this comes back to it again. I think if you're actually losing, listening to your heart, you define who your ideal client is. It's, it's, it shouldn't be hard for you to say no. And you should always say no over revenue growth at the end of the day. It's really, really important that you have standards and rules and, and regulations, but this comes back down to getting really clear in your vivid vision. So if, if you haven't read the book, Vivid Vision by Cameron Harold, that'd be a good place to start is that you have to have clarity on where your business is going first. And if you have clarity, then you'll be able to effectively communicate and create filters and rules on who should be your ideal client. Um, at the end of the day, and you should never deviate from that. You actually, you may not grow as fast at first, but you definitely go further and faster later. It kind of works like compound interest does, you know, so you may not see all of it right away, but as time goes on, you get that hyper, hyper growth at the end of the tail. It's in the long tail where it grows, but for businesses that don't do that, you, you, you can end up spinning your wheels and getting stuck that you never end up experiencing the hyper growth. And, I, and I've done this, and I know this specifically from example, that when you close the wrong client, you just end up with churn, you end up with low morale in your, in your clients, you end up, you know, lowering the ability to, to really scale. And often this happens as well, too, when people are building a business that's not product based and everything is super custom, right? And it's okay to do that. If that's your business, some people want a lifestyle business. They just want five to 10 clients and, and they want to be super creative and they want everything to be unique. You know, God bless you. That's great. But that's not a business that's ever going to sell one day. That's not a business you're ever going to get free from one day. And that's not a business that you're going to be able to scale. It's very, very difficult, difficult to scale. (laughs) Have you always built your businesses with, with a sale or exit in mind or no, I, I didn't. I didn't really know. Like, I mean, sure, you kind of dream about that happening. But my first business, like after the, after the lead gen, I merged it. I didn't even, so my, my, my exiting was actually merging into a larger company. And then I had an exit through that third company and not in your traditional sense um, mm-hmm. either. So all, all my processes were not your typical exit. Like I would say today, I still have not built a company that then I officially kind of sold and packaged and sold. And so um, I would say that it's only through the third company that I started thinking about that and looking at that and, and even preparing for some of those options and even experiencing some uh, cases where we went through the process of possibly being um, acquired and, 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 and selling the business. So I would say, no. And I would say that the best businesses that sell with the highest multiple actually have no intention of, yeah. uh, of selling, right? And so it, a lot of times if your intention is to sell and that you often will take a lot of wrong turns right. in, that, in that process. It's, it's kind of a happy byproduct that happens from doing the right things, I think. Right. Yeah. So if you can take, if you can, I'm going to go a different direction here. If you could zoom in back in time and and sort of hover around uh, or above 20 year old Matt, and I think you're probably getting recruited by a quick star uh, rep or something at, at that point or, or Amway, but in advance of, of say 2005, um, if you had the opportunity to talk to young Matt Hunt at that point, uh, what are you telling him? 
Hmm. I think I would have told them to uh, have a kid sooner. <laughs> How many kids you got? Uh, three. Nice. So I had my first kid at 31. And that helped me, that helped focus me a lot. And so before that, I me was too. all over the place. I had, I, I, had 4 million projects trying to do a bunch of things. So until I sort of focused on a little bit of a fire behind me where it wasn't just about me anymore was when I actually started doing uh, good work. Hmm. The second thing I would have told myself is I would have taught myself on how to get started with investing a little bit sooner. So I had some limiting beliefs that I didn't think that I could do some things like buy a home <laughs> or, or house hack or do any of these things because I didn't think that I would qualify for those without investigating further. And so I think if I had a head start on taking care of my personal finances first, I would have also made better decisions for my business finances <laughs> later because they're connected, right? So <laughs> if you're poor and financially struggling personally, it's hard to make good decisions for your business. And then the third thing I would have told myself is uh, get going on being an entrepreneur sooner because you are for sure an entrepreneur and you don't even fucking know it yet. So yeah. like get in there and get going, right? So that would have been the three things I probably would have told my 20 year old self. That's awesome. The, there are a number of people listening um, to this podcast that uh, have podcasts themselves or want to get into, to uh, you know, this type of media distribution. Um, so just as an aside, uh, for those of you that are not watching this, um, Matt has a pretty good setup there. Do you have any, any tips or tricks on, on what, uh, equipment to use and, and what do you got? What do you got there in the back? Oh, so I don't, I, equipment wise, I think it's really simple. You can literally spend 400 bucks on Amazon and get everything you need. So get yourself a decent mic, one with an arm. Yeah. That's going to cost you about 300 bucks. There's, there's all kinds of reviews online that you can figure out which one that you want to use. I'm using a Yeti mic, um, but it doesn't really matter. The big mistake that people actually make with the microphone is they don't have it close enough to their face. <laughs> so they get they get a little weirded out that there's something close to them that way and they have it too far away that it's ineffective. So it needs to be just a few inches away from your mouth, but not directly on your mouth. So you don't end up with all the popping of the peas. All, all the COVID yeah, on it. Yeah, all the COVID on it. Then you just need a decent, uh, you know, ring light, which is like 150 bucks, um, just so your face is lit up or in, or at least stand in front of a, a window where people can see. So you can get a little bit of what's called catch light in your eye. So this is where you have like a little, little ring in your eye. And when you have that ring in your eye, if you're doing video, it's not, it doesn't matter so much for audio and podcasting. It, it makes it look like you're a little more charming. It's a trick that film and photographers use all the time. So you might as well use it as well for yourself too. And then, you know, you want to make sure you have a decent camera if you're using video or YouTube, but for podcasting, you won't need this. But if you do try and get a 1080p camera on yourself as a minimum so that you have you, you look, you know, not fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> and of course the standard stuff of being in a quiet space and no distractions, not a distracting background, you know, those things are important too. Um, and I think that you should always film it in video first, even if you're doing a, po a podcast, because you can repurpose all that content. You can always strip the audio for your podcast and then you can reuse it for snackable content or long form content on your YouTube channel or social medias, the interwebs, et cetera. The, the webs, yeah. the interwebs. The webs. The webs. Cool. You, uh, you, you've talked, uh, you talked a lot about this um, already today, uh, but in order to summarize, I, I want to paint the picture of, a, of an entree, okay? So if, if business growth and scale was a, a delicious meal, mm -hmm. regardless of your industry, regardless of your history, regardless of any of those things, what are, what are the fundamental, the key ingredients that need to go into that, into that meal to achieve growth? Sure that have stood the test of time. Yeah, so business is actually not super complicated. So there's three major pillars to all business. Pillar number one is prospecting, sales, and then marketing, and in that order. 
generally speaking. Okay. <laughs> For B2B business specifically, um, <clears throat> if you, if you can't make sales, you don't have market, you don't have marketing dollars. That's why it flows in there. So you got to figure out a way to get in front of people <laughs> to build relationships with them, close them, make some money. And then you have some for marketing to put fuel in the fire. That's pillar number one. Pillar number two is operations. This is you fulfilling your service or product, delighting your customers, managing your team. Pillar number three is the fun stuff, which is actually focusing on scaling the business, investing the business, acquiring other partners, exiting. This is working on your business stuff versus in your business stuff. They flow in that order. The big mistake, <clears throat> excuse me, the big mistake most people make is they start, they try to work on different parts in different order. order. So they might be working and optimizing their product or their website or designing their business card or trying to fix some operations problem, but yet they have no way of getting predictable sales. Well, that's not what you should be focused on right now. Or they but dream. Matt, but Matt, if I have a great <laughs> business card, I'm set. You are set. Yeah, nice. that's it. Spend, spend 30 days building your website. So, you know, I think the order is even beyond that is like, now I won't even start a business anymore unless I can sell it in advance without even a website, like just a, some social media posting or me doing cold outreach to sell it first as a beta. And I let people vote with their wallets. So if, if people will give me money and then I tell them you're in a beta, so it's going to be rough. <laughs> and not perfect. And you're going to help me iron out these kinks to figure out what the hell this business is. So that's probably the best way of setting it up. Fundamentally, all the best businesses in the world are built on people who understand that they need to build a community, an audience and a tribe and build deep trust with that community. And and tribe and audience. And if you do that, the byproduct is usually a lot of leads and sales and predictability that you can weather just about any situation that happens mm -hmm. in business. That's so awesome. that would be where you want to start. And universally, even if you don't know where you want to start or not sure, the best thing to do is to lead with actually building a community and audience where you think you might want to live as a space for a while. And if you can build a relationship and goodwill with them, you can just ask them what problems they have and what they'd be happily to pay for if someone was willing to do it. And that will create your, your product, the winner. And so this is a very Kickstarter type approach, um, you know, at the end of the day, but that's the best way to, to scale, even continually as you want to scale, as you release new things. If you have that, you will always do well. And one thing I've learned is services and products and businesses come and go. But if you own the community and your personal brand within the community and your reputation, you can always use that as a launching pad to build something else faster next time. Hmm. Besides just stumbling over yourself and figuring it out, who, like, are there any characters that have shown up frequently over the last decade that you, you draw inspiration from? No, oh, so so many. I, I I stand on the shoulders of giants. I mean, I, I didn't. I, I don't have an original idea in 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 any of my bones. Like this is all stuff that I've bor borrowed and, or stolen and used from other smarter people than me. There, there's so many. So I can list off a bunch of people that um, definitely stand out. Some I have actually worked with and been coached by, and others are just distant mentors that I've listened to on on podcasts or books. Um, some people are are peers. Um, you know, one of the one of the best decisions I ever made with my first agency was creating a mastermind Skype group with all my competitors and they all turned into my very best friends <laughs> and we all helped each other grow multi-million dollar businesses by just helping each other and what you find out eventually once you know that there's you believe in a world of abundance is there's more than enough room for everybody and everybody just does it a little bit differently or they all niche out to slightly different verticals that they specialize in and so there's very very little crossover at all so that, that was, that was universally super helpful to my growth is, is, you know, the idea that more than one head is, is, is better 
than, than one, right? So if you can put a group of 20, 30, 40 people into a private master fund, you're, you're going to grow more at the end right. of the day. So some people that I really look up to and aspire to, um, uh, you know, there's Will Reynolds from Sear Interactive, who runs an agency out of Philadelphia. He, you know, I've met him a couple of times, talked to him. He came and spoke at my conference once. We're not super close, but I super aspire to what he's doing and, and what he stands for. Um, some of the highlights that he's done in his career that just blow my mind is, you know, he stepped down from being the CEO very early on in his career to just live as the innovation officer at the end of the day. I don't know if that's his actual job title, but the fact that he recognized that he was not going to be the right leader to grow his company hmm. and put the right put the right bums in the right seats right away has been instrumental to his happiness and his career. So you don't always necessarily need to be, you, you may not, may not need to be, or shouldn't be the leader of your own organization. He still owns a hundred percent of the company, right? And it's super profitable and super well, but, and, and he's built everything based on value. So from day one, he determined what the company's values are going to be. And he hires and fires and makes every decision on clients and everything he does based on those values. So he has four or five values and that's the, the operating system for it. And it seems mm -hmm. to work really well from, for him at a distance from what I can recognize. And I just think it's amazing what he's doing. Other people I look up to is Jason Gaynard from mastermind talks. Again, another person at a distance, someone again, who, who struggled at the beginning of his journey, but now lives a life of, purpose and intention and runs one annual event per year that 10,000 people apply to. And he only accepts 150 people to per year. And he looks at every single application and he spends an entire year planning this three-day event. And the event is, I think, around $10,000 to go to. I think he has a couple workshops now throughout the year, but incredible story. He has a podcast called Community Made that you can binge watch, uh, listen to. I uh, highly recommend you do. He, his guests on there are, are absolutely incredible. Um, one of my coaches um, who coached me was Cameron Harold um, from the Coup Alliance. And he has a, a, a podcast called Second in Command. And his focus is on helping the chief operating officers and organizations or whoever is second in command in operations manage the team and work with the CEO. So it's a really unique um, uh, coaching program. Another one would be Tacky Moore. Um, he basically has created, and most people don't know about him, but I would say that every system is, is that's group coaching is based off of his stuff in some way. So you can see Dan Martell from the SAS Academy coming out of there. You, you can see it, there's just, it's just endless amounts of people. You'll, if you really get to see his work, he's influenced everybody's work on one to many coaching and creating these programs. And he's absolutely the most amazing teacher when it comes to teaching this stuff and has influenced me greatly on how I conduct my business. A couple other standouts would be Joe Polish from the Genius Network, Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach. Um, these guys have been doing this for a long time and have they know, they, they understand the power of community and relationships and trust and have been in, all, in on all that for a very, very long time and have probably touched almost every entrepreneur around the world because of um, that approach. So awesome. those would be a few that I'd call out. Cool. When people ask me the same question, uh, you are definitely in that roster for me. So ah, oh, thank it's, you. It's, it's great. <laughs> so 20, uh, 2020 was weird. I mean, it was, it was weird. It was a fucking weird year, man. Yeah, you can weird. say it. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a fucked up. You year. know what though? You, I mean, you always <laughs> want to look at silver lining and I, I think our team is tighter. Uh, culture is deep. Uh, fuck, you know, we spent a good six months just thinking about ourselves and, and working on yeah. ourselves. And you don't always have that opportunity as an agency, although you should take the time. Um, you know, I have a 17, 16, 17 month old daughter, uh, yeah. just spent tons of time with her. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and you're hearing this pop up more and more, especially in the people that I hang out with is that 2020 was pretty, pretty sweet actually, uh, in a number of different ways. Um, so, but moving forward, what is, 2021 look like for you? What is the next mountain you're climbing? Um, where, where your, where your focus set is set? 
Yeah, that's a great Where question. Where is I, your focus set? There we go. <laughs> yeah, so I so 2020, uh, I had a bunch of different brands that I was experimenting. So this fourth business that I started as a beta that I got some paid clients from in which you were one of the beta ones was I was trying to figure out what this business was. And I finally uh, figured it out just a few months ago. So I'm pulling everything together and rebranding is called army of trust. And essentially its theme is to help other B2B businesses, most, most specifically agency owners scale their businesses through four invisible funnels that are focused on community and trust building. And so that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, and is the primary focus. Awesome. Where, uh, you know, I have one more question after this, but where, where do you want to send uh, people? Um, where can we find out more about you? Where can we Well, if you're along? hearing it right now, you would go to automationwolf.com and that's what you see there. But in the new year, it, all of that will redirect to armyoftrust.com. Okay. Okay. Um, Businesses that achieve, and this is, this is how I wrap up, but businesses. So in advance of this, thank you again, sir. It's amazing uh, to have you. You're always very gracious with your time and generous with your time. So I, I really appreciate it. And I think everyone listening um, got a ton of value just from this, this hour. So I thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for having me, Caleb. Businesses that achieve growth and scale often have, you know, a leader that has strong um, that, you know, they often have a strong leader at the helm, but I think strong leaders and, and, and strong business owners have a very specific, very effective morning, afternoon, or evening routine. So can we talk a little bit about what the routine is for, for yourself? For sure. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's changed over the years, depending on what role I am in and what's appropriate for my family. But generally speaking, I'm an early riser. And if I can, I like to start my day with exercise. However, currently right now, I'm not starting my day with exercise. I'm, I'm ending it at the end of the day before the kids come home because it's more convenient for my wife and we like to work out together. It gives us an opportunity to connect together and to take care of our, our health. So health is wealth and it gives us a minute to just pause and, and think. Over the years, I've spent different times um, journaling and practicing um, the practice of being grateful for something each day. It's very hard to be in a negative space if you lead your day with being grateful. I've since simplified it into a simpler process for me. And so it's as simple as me. I just write down three core things that I want to get accomplished today. It's, and I think of it as the three things that will knock down all the other dominoes. So what is the lead domino? What is the most important thing that I can be working on in my company right now? And I only give myself three things with lots of breathing room because I know there's going to be all kinds of interruptions throughout the day. And I, I schedule for the interruptions now. And then I write down one thing I'm grateful for every single day. And it just allows me to, to start the day in the right headspace. I then take my mornings and I usually use it for all focused work. So I don't have team meetings. I do not uh, meet with clients. Uh, I do not do podcasting. I don't do any of that stuff. I save that stuff for the afternoons uh, because I find that I don't need to be focused to do it. So um, that's how I schedule. And then I schedule entirely Mondays and Tuesdays for focus days. All like there's no one who gets on my calendar for those days. And then Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, I do allow other things to take place. So that's my current schedule. Um, but I also work seven days a week and I never used to, and I used to try to take days off or I used to believe, oh, you need to have all these days off as an entrepreneur. But for me personally, what I've come to realize is that it causes me more anxiety, not doing my work or not feeling productive to do something that I can't be present right. with my loved ones uh, when I take time off. So what I've learned for me, and this is everybody's journey is different, is if I get up in the morning, including Saturdays and Sundays, and I get to do some things that I've been wanting to do, because I always have an endless to-do list for myself. I've just always been that way. I have books, I've got notes, I've got things I need to create and do. And if I'm not allowed to create and do at the beginning of the day, 
is very hard for me to turn off later in the day. <laughs> and so I spend the mornings always creating and doing and doing work. And then that way I can be super present with my sons or with my wife and, and other things. And so that's, my, that's the way my week looks and my days look um, to do it. And I know that if I don't get exercise done I, early in the day, I won't get it. And then I fast every day. I don't usually eat uh, until dinner time. As a general rule, I've been doing that oh, for a couple so of years. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So from the morning till dinner time, you're not eating. I don't eat. Yeah. And what is that? How did this come to be? Does that just help you tap into your energy reserves or where, how, what's the benefit? Yeah, so I started studying about intermittent fasting a number of years ago and found all the health benefits to it. But I also just found that one, I just didn't need breakfast. It was easy for me to skip. And then uh, generally speaking, I, I found that I didn't need lunch either. And so I just power through and, and then I eat from like dinner, I'll, I'll eat dinner and then I'll graze till like eight or nine at night. And I like to go to bed with a full belly and I have, a, that's just works well for me. And it, and so the, you can, you can Google it, learn all about it, but there's a lot of health benefits for intermittent fasting that they've already it, just read up on anything written and published yeah, yeah. by David Sinclair you know, and okay. you can learn all about it. He's the expert on it. It's better for you to, to learn it from him and other people like him yeah. of why you may want to experiment with that in your life. And everybody does a little bit different. Most common one is 16 and eight, where people fast for 16 hours and eat for eight. Mine would be 20 and 24. So I'm not quite an OMAD diet, but I'd be at 20 and 24. Hey, it works for you, man. That's, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It keeps me going to 250 pounds. So it keeps me at a nice lean, leaner weight. <laughs> it keeps you away from 250. Yeah. That's, no, that's good. I was like 245 Come at, on. One, at one point. Yeah. Six, two. I mean, it didn't look that heavy cause I'm six, yeah. two, but, but 245 was what I was at. And then, you know, I kind of lived around 220 for a long time and, and now I'm, I'm getting closer to 200, which is where I'd really like to be. That's, that's a nice pretty much me. When I was, yeah. when I was playing football, I was 245, 240, 6'2, And, and now I, uh, feeling better, feeling thin. So yeah, thin's good. Thin, thin's good. Being light on your feet is, is good. That's right. Just in case you got to get away. <laughs> That's, you, you never know. <laughs> hey, so I, I mean, I knew I was going to get half a dozen nuggets again from you and I, and I talk to you uh, every once in a while. So um, I'm looking forward to Army of Trust in Army of Trust, right? Army of Trust. You Army got of it. Trust in 2021. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, thank you so much. You are episode number I'm going to screw this up. One, two, three, thank you. You're four. You are number four. Awesome. I like number four. That's a good number. Thanks so much, Matt. We'll talk thank to you Thank you, Caleb. You, you take it easy. Let's keep in touch. You bet. Bye now. Yeah.